Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this car meeting. Uh, to th this particular car meeting is focused on a theme striving towards equity and flourishing in the HIV response. And I want to introduce you myself. I'm Eric Arts. I'm a conference co-chair along with Carmen Logie. And uh, we're here to present uh, what I think is going to be an outstanding meeting. Um, we already had the Red Ribbon Award winner present, and I heard it was a very exciting talk. Uh, I'm in a strange situation, as you probably can see by my appearance. I'm actually on a bus in Uganda, and I had to find a, a spot that would allow for me to have proper reception to actually do this opening and uh, introduction. Unfortunately, we are not in London, Ontario, as you all know, and um, you know, as it happens with SARS-CoV-2 and the Omicron outbreak, we had to uh, turn to a virtual meeting again. But we will hopefully have you in London in the future. But for now, you can get a quick glimpse of where I am in Uganda. Um, and I think it's appropriate in some ways just by our theme for this year's conference and trying to get uh, an increase in and maintain this momentum we have towards equity uh, for HIV care and treatment. And that's the focus of our meeting. Um, so I'm gonna take a few moments um, to just thank everyone and all the organizers and uh, this transition that we had to partake in is very challenging. And uh, it's been great uh, to have such great organization uh, at CAR for this meeting. And uh, for all of our uh, co-chairs in this meeting, uh, for all the tracks, uh, they did an outstanding job in organizing what I think is going to be an outstanding um, meeting uh, covering lots of topics that uh, I think will be of great interest. So um, we're not gonna take too long and Carmen's gonna come on right after me, but um, I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to um, discuss uh, the Weinberg lecture. Um, it's a lecture that we've had for quite a number of years now. Um, and many of you may or may not know, I, uh, Mark was very close to me. Uh, I was his graduate student, like so many others in Canada. So I'm not special that way in no means. Uh, but he was also a, a bit of a second father to me, if you will. Um, he was always there uh, scientifically and whenever I needed advice. And I think he was there for so many people in uh, the Canadian research uh, in HIV and AIDS. And uh, he still sorely missed every, every second day or every week. I think it would be so nice to be able to call Mark and ask for his advice. Uh, like many of you out there probably wish he was still around as well. As you know, he was a great advocate, a prior president of uh, the International AIDS Society, a great advocate for HIV healthcare, brought the first international AIDS conference to Africa, um, in South Africa, and was a strong advocate for treatment and was early on um, very much against the AIDS denialists in uh, their approach in, in understanding this disease and providing better assistance for people around the world. So I could go on and on about what Mark achieved. I think what's more sad about is what he could have provided um, if he was still with us today. So uh, I think this Weinberg lecture is a great memorial to Mark and I know his family very much appreciates it. So I'll leave it to Carmen and uh, thanks for coming to this meeting. And uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, from Uganda uh, at the meeting. Thank you so much, Eric. I wanna join you in welcoming everyone to CAR 2022. I remember my first CAR conference was 15 years ago. I was a doctoral student and it was my first time presenting at any conference, being surrounded by community members and advocates, clinicians, and researchers and persons embodying several of these roles is inspiring, informative, and helps to build a community of people in Canada focused on health, equity, rights, and well being in the context of HIV. Needless to say, CAR has made a huge impact 
helping me feel connected to the larger community of HIV researchers in Canada. And today I'm grateful to be a co-chair and to welcome you alongside Dr. Eric Arts. And now it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Moni, Mona Lutfi for the Mark Weinberg Lecture. She is an infectious disease specialist, clinician scientist, and full professor at Women's College Hospital and the University of Toronto with expertise in women and HIV and reproductive health and HIV. Her main practice is in Toronto at the Maple Leaf Medical Clinic, where she specializes in caring for women, couples, youth, and street-involved people living with HIV. She also does clinics in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and she founded the Women in HIV Research Program in 2006 and uses community-based research, working in partnership with women living with HIV to address issues most important to them. In addition to these accomplishments, she is an astounding mentor. My own HIV research career began working with Mona and Wangari Thoreau with the Women's Community-Based Research Project in 2006 at Women's Health and Women's Hands Community Health Center. Not only has Mona mentored me, but multiple generations of scholars, clinicians, and activists, even winning a mentorship award. She actively gives opportunities to emerging scholars and supports career development wherever your trajectory is. If I want to celebrate any accomplishment or award or new adventure, Mona is among the first persons I will call. She is committed to learning and growing, to lifting people up within and through her work that aims to spark social change, and she is a global leader on women-centered HIV care. Mona is incredibly optimistic, believing that research can and does make a difference. And she is practical, wanting to ensure that research, that the research she does translates into better care, better lives, and better quality of life and equity for women and people living with HIV. It is my great honor to introduce this outstanding researcher, doctor, advocate, and personal friend. Wow, thank you so much, Carmen. Uh, what a generous introduction. And thank you so much to the CAR Conference Organizing Committee for give me, giving me the honor to be the Mark Weinberg Lecturer this year. I, I really want to take a moment to mention how grateful and honored I am for this privilege. It really is a privilege. And I, Maureen, I heard uh, your speech for the Red Ribbon Award, a big congratulations. And I think my talk will complement uh, your uh, speech and uh, show some of the statistics to, uh, to verify what you've said. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement of where the conference is being held this year, London, Ontario. I'm very excited because London, Ontario was actually where I was born. My parents immigrated from Cairo, Egypt as young, eager students to attend Western University. So I identify as a settler and I acknowledge my settler privilege, which at a min minimum is the education my parents and I received at Western. London, Ontario is the traditional territory of the Anawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lunapawak peoples, who have long standing connections to the land and water of the region. The land is covered by the L London Township Treaty Number no. Six, which is a part of the Upper Canada Treaties. My, in my talk and for my talk, I honor the local Indigenous community based organizations. And here is one of them at LOSA, Family Healing Services, who is dedicated to strengthening communities through Indigenous led programs. Such community organizations are essential. And with my Indigenous colleagues, I stand in solidarity and allyship to make the truth and reconciliation uh, a, um, a reality. Here is my disclosure slide. Here is how I aim to mitigate bias in my talk. Okay, like Eric did, I have to start with an homage to Dr. Mark Weinberg, my colleague, my mentor, and my friend. Mark was a hero to me. He was a social justice warrior. Like Eric, I learned so much from Mark and I always had so much fun with him. I miss him. And I wish he was here today to listen to my talk. I hope my talk 
does his legacy justice. And Mark, I promise to continue your social justice passion. I dedicate my talk to my colleagues, to all my women colleagues. We did it. I am up here giving the most prestigious HIV lecture in Canada because of all the hard work we did together. You all know who you are. And I feel like it is all of us together standing up here talking. I thank you. And also to the many amazing men that I worked with over the years, and again, you know who you are. You're represented by this little blue cloud in the corner. I really thank you. And it's been great working all together. I also dedicate my talk and I thank the community deeply to the women living with HIV that I've worked with and learned from. Thank you to the community leaders, research participants, community researchers and consultants. And thank you to my patients. You embraced me, encouraged me, supported me, challenged me, and you've taught me all so much. Thank you. This is depicted in this beautiful diagram of the Community at Heart framework, which was created by Claudette Cardinal and Nilufar Aran. This framework shows that community really is at the heart of our work. This framework highlights the importance of building relations, reciprocal teaching, respect, and community leadership. Thank you, Claudette and Nilu, for this, this work. Okay, finally, my objectives. When I embarked to develop this presentation, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, what, what am I gonna talk about? And I realized, that there are hundreds of women HIV researchers in Canada. And I really felt I wanted and I, I needed to honor them. So I will review the history of these women HIV researchers in Canada. I will also present the issues that remain most important to women living with HIV in Canada. And I will end by hoping to call you all in as allies to address gender-based and other inequities experienced by women and girls affected by HIV in Canada. Let's see how I do. Okay, objective one, reviewing the history of women HIV researchers in Canada. Where do I start? I thought to myself, maybe I could make some kind of timeline. Well, how was I gonna do that? Well, I decided, to design the making of my timeline and this objective like a research study. I am a researcher after all. So I came up with research questions. Who were the original women researchers in Canada? What were their stories? What, are, what were their experiences? I interviewed 55 women HIV researchers who live in Canada. Each interview was 20 to 60 minutes each. If I didn't get you in for an interview, like you, Carmen, I can still do the interview. I'm going to probably write a book about it. I defined a, a woman as being anyone who, who identifies as a woman, as a trans woman, or as a gender non-binary individual with feminine identity. I interviewed 43 academic researchers and 12 community uh, researchers or knowledge users, and uh, them being all women living with HIV. I asked each one of them four questions. What has it been like? Have you had any challenges? What advice would you give to a junior woman HIV researcher and anything else? Here you go. Here is uh, my timeline of the original women HIV researchers in Canada, which I defined as researchers before the year 2000, or as my children would call them, the OGs. And uh, I apologize for anyone missing or misplaced on this timeline. If you are missed or misplaced, please let me know by email and I'll adjust it. We all know that the first case of HIV in North America was in 1981. And from my interviews, I learned that the first case of HIV in Canada 
was in 1983. And in 1981, Kate Hankins was the Deputy Medical Officer of Health in, in Calgary, and Bluma Brenner was starting to do HIV research with Mark Weinberg. They are the OGs. Also a part of the OG group uh, what it, are Mary Fanning, Anita Rackless, and Sharon Walmsley, who started caring for dozens of, of, pa of, peop of patients, most of course men um, in, uh, with HIV in 1983. In 1985, social and ep epidemiology scientists, most notably Liviana Calcivera and Peggy Melson and others started doing groundbreaking research. And then you can see what happened. The number of women HIV researchers kept growing and growing. And I asked myself, why are there so many women HIV researchers per capita for a field in research, other than maybe women's health, there are a, a significant number of women who do HIV uh, research. Uh, when I asked this question, a lot of people said, oh, it's because women are, are more caring. What I learned from the interviews was in the, in the 80s and 90s, actually, a lot of women went into the field because of homophobia and others weren't going into the field. So women are doing HIV research and, uh, um, because they're social justice warriors. And I thank these original women HIV researchers. You paved the way for so many of us. And now you won't believe this, how many women HIV researchers there are in Canada. Look at this slide. My team helped me to find the names of women who are doing HIV research in Canada today. Community researchers, academic researchers, postgraduate fellows, students, and more. If you identify as a woman HIV researcher and you don't find your name on this list, again, email me. And, and, and I'll add it. This list is probably not complete and it would likely be double this. Hundreds and hundreds of women HIV researchers. Isn't that incredible? But what I learned from my interviews is that it has not been easy for many of these women, particularly the original women, but even also for more recent women um, HIV researchers, particularly racialized women researchers. We heard of the difficulties Maureen uh, went through um, as a Black woman researcher. Um, it has definitely been rewarding, amazing, and fun, and worth it. Everyone said that in the interviews, but for many, it has been hard. And I'll show you why, and I'll give you uh, an example. Here is, I'm using CAR as an example for H, as an HIV uh, research organization in Canada, not, not, not to, to uh, call out uh, uh, CAR or, or um, but just to use it as an example and to ask all of us to look at our organizations and to look at the structures and leadership in our organizations. As you can see, despite hundreds of women HIV researchers there's been a gender gap in leadership positions. CAR was founded in 1991. There's been 16 presidents to date, and of those, three have been women. That's 19%. Next year, Dr. Marissa Brecker from Winnipeg will be president. Congratulations, Ressa. Okay, look at the Mark Weinberg lecture. I have the I, I give the Mark Weinberg lecture as an example, and I'd like us to all think about our keynote lecture. First, Mark Weinberg lectures, and out of 20 speakers, I am the seventh woman. Better odds, seven to 13 or 35%. However, I believe that I am the seventh cis woman, first non-white woman, maybe first non-white speaker, depending on how uh, Julio Montana identifies his race. While I don't identify as white, 
have a look at me. I sure do pass as white. I, and what I do identify as is as a Middle Eastern um, and Arab woman. I also identify as a straight cisgender uh, uh, settler woman, and I notice the lack of LGBTQ speakers in the Mark Weinberg lecture. Uh, this is also an uh, issue internationally. I looked at several uh, organizations across the world, but due to brevity, um, I've only picked uh, the International Aid Society, which was founded in 1988. There's been 16 presidents, 12 men, and four women. I do think that we need to call it what it is. It's patriarchy. For those of you who don't know the definition of patriarchy, patriarchy is, tr is traditionally defined as a society in which the power is held by men. Patriarchy is structural sexism. Similarly, even more so than sexism, there is obvious racial discrimination in research as well as homophobia and transphobia. I know that it is not always done intentionally since as Bell Hooks teaches, we are all programmed to uphold patriarchy. We have all been programmed to see patriarchy as normal. Even when I was car conference co-chair, I chose a white cis straight man as the Mark Weinberg lecture. We are all to blame as again, we have been programmed for patriarchy. As all of us have had our eyes opened over the last five years. I have also. And I want to ask you along with me that we continue to open our eyes wider and wider. As my objective three outlines, I don't want to call out these issues with shaming, which I have done in the past and I apologize for that. I want to call you in to work together as Doris Peltier and our uh, conference elder uh, just said, to work together in a circle, to make change for more equity in our world. And in this context, the world of HIV research and HIV in Canada. And we have made strides. Look at the list of keynote speakers at CAR this year, three women, one black scholar and a gay male colleague of mine. I commend the organizing committee, but we are not done. We have to keep going year after year, examining the leadership and the speakers and the structures of our organizations. We need to strive and we need to demand equity. Okay, on to objective two, women and HIV. That is my area. So we're gonna spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about women and HIV. While preparing this talk, I realized that I rarely give a talk anymore on women and HIV without honoring the principle of the meaningful engagement of women living with HIV and AIDS and have come to realize how important hearing from people living with HIV in our work is. And therefore I'd like to welcome Brecklin Bertozzi to join me to present this section. Brecklin, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Brecklin Bertozzi. I'm a community researcher in Hamilton, Ontario. I started as a peer researcher in 2012, and now I'm a peer engagement coordinator for the Heads Up 2 study with the University of Victoria, BC. I'm a woman living with HIV and a mother, and I have a lot of passion for community-based research. Thanks so much, uh, Brecklin, uh, for joining me. You know how much it means to me. Before Brecklin reviews our work from the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, I'm going to review some of the epidemiology of women and HIV. Here is the global epidemiology. Most of you probably know, as of 2020, there were 36 million adults living with HIV around the world. And of those, 53.6% were women. We don't have the time to review in detail, 
but I'm sure you can imagine um, that, uh, that because of social, political and biologic reasons, this is known as the feminization of HIV. Here is the epidemiology of HIV uh, for Canada. As of 2020, there were approximately 70,000 people living with HIV in Canada. In that year, there were 1,639 new cases of HIV, a 21% decrease from 2019, assumed to be due to the decreased testing because of the COVID pandemic. Of new diagnoses, 28.6% were listed as female. These reports still report sex rather than gender. Um, I asked my team and they helped me to compile the percentage of new HIV cases that were women over the past decade in Canada from 2011 onwards. Um, and, and in 2011, the percentage of new cases that were women was 23.8%. And then in 2019, 30.2% and 2020, 28.6%. Uh, I can't verify it, but like Maureen spoke about, um, I think there is a worrisome increasing trend of, uh, of, a new, of new cases of HIV in women, or at least the proportion being women. And of the new uh, female cases in 2020, 42.1% were black women and 40% indigenous women as uh, compared to their male counterparts where 38.5% were white. As mentioned in, uh, in my introduction, I do clinics in uh, Northern Saskatchewan. Um, it's not, I do that, I go there uh, because it's beautiful, uh, but also uh, uh, for this reason. In Saskatchewan, there are about 170 to 200 new cases of HIV per year, an incident rate of 15.7 per 100,000 in 2020, nearly four times the national average of 4.3 per 100,000. What I'm concerned about is the feminization of HIV in the province of Saskatchewan and might be occurring in other prairie provinces. This is probably, this is mirroring what's happening globally with increasing percentages of new cases being in women. As you can see, 47% of the new cases in 2019 were women. And in 2020, 55% of the new HIV cases were women. This is of great concern. And I believe that we all across the country have to be allies to take action. I'll pass it on to Brecklin now to present some of our work of what we're doing and what we're trying to do to address this. Thanks, Mona. So in 2010, we set out to help answer questions for women living with HIV across Canada about their experiences, health outcomes, and what care they were getting and wanted with our study, the Canadian HIV Women's Sexual and Reproductive Health Cohort Study, or CHIWOS for short. CHIWOS has been grounded in principles of critical feminine, feminism, anti-oppression, social justice, the greater involvement of people living with HIV and AIDS, and the meaningful engagement of women living with HIV and AIDS. CHIWOS uses community-based research involving women living with HIV as core partners throughout all stages of the research. I was a CHIWOS Peer Research Associate, or PRA for short, which I now call Community Research Consultant. As PRAs, we enrolled and conducted three surveys 18 months apart with 1,422 women living with HIV in BC, Ontario, and Quebec. Here are the demographics of the women who participated in CHIWOS. Their median age was 43, 96% identified as cisgender, 
and 4% as trans or gender diverse, 22% identified as Indigenous, 41% as white and 30% as Afrin Caribbean Black and 7% of other ethnicities. While 84% had a high school education or higher, 64% were living on an income of less than $20,000 per year. 64% reported being food insecure and 11% housing insecure. Of the 1,312 women who answered the questions on violence at the baseline visit, 80% reported experiencing a form of violence in adulthood. I'll say that again, 80%, a very high number, which is prompting many women HIV researchers to be working on trauma-informed and trauma-aware care models. Here is an elegant longitudinal analysis that Dr. Carmen Logie led with the CHIWOS data, which found that at time point two, 25% of the women reported violence in the prior three months, so meaning current violence in their lives. And recent violence was associated with the intersecting stigmas of HIV-related stigma, racial discrimination, and gender discrimination real evidence of the impact of intersectional stigma and all contributed to increased depression. At the baseline visit using the CESD, 48.6% of women indicated they had depressive symptoms, another crucial topic to women living with HIV. Another very important issue for li women living with HIV is HIV-related stigma. With women reporting a median stigma score of 62.5 out of 100, with high scores of personalized stigma, disclosure stigma, and issues with public attitude. HIV-related stigma, stigma being an issue rarely dealt with clinically. Two other analyses led by Dr. Logie showed the importance of HIV-related stigma and other intersecting stigmas on not only physical and mental quality of life, but also the cascade of HIV care. Stigma is important for clinical outcomes. We need to pay attention. Chivos, with the leadership of Yasmin Persad and Ashley Lacombe Duncan, has concentrated on quite a bit of work with trans women living with HIV. And I'm excited to present the results, as I believe there are many misconceptions about trans women and HIV in Canada. While other countries report a high prevalence of HIV among trans women, in Canada, it is not as high. It is likely closer to 2 to 3 percent. That uh, being that only two to 3% of trans women in Canada are living with HIV. And look at this, trans women who participated in CHIWOS also had excellent cascade of HIV care numbers with 92% being in care and on antiretroviral therapy. And over half were accessing medical gender affirming therapy. As a team, we took the five CHIWOS peer reviewed papers involving trans women with HIV and the 54 other peer-reviewed uh, CHIVOS papers and used concept mapping to depict the health experiences of trans women living with HIV in a single diagram and a similar diagram, which, which looks just like this uh, for all women living with HIV. Gifted to us by elder Valerie Nicholson, it was set out to be and called Honoring the Voices of the Women Who Participated in Chivos. And, and, uh, and the image is uh, called The Wheel of Resilience and Support. Also over the past decade, the Chivos team with many colleagues developed a model of care, the woman-centered HIV care model. 
to address some of the issues that women in Chiwo shared with us. And here it is. The model is in the shape of a house to represent safety and stability. Trauma and violence aware care is the foundation. Person-centered care with attention to social determinants of health and family make up the first floor. The second floor contains three rooms and represents integrated care, HIV integrated with women's health care, including sexual and reproductive health and rights and mental health and addiction care. Peer support, leadership, and capacity building are integral to women-centered HIV care and make up the roof. A woman is present larger than the house as she is the most important part and may be supported by peers to enter the house. The model is meant to be provided to all women in all their diversity and for all different ages. Isn't it great? Thanks, Brecklin. Yes, I think it's great. Um, okay, I think I have a good, um, uh, let me see, 10, 15 minutes left um, of our talk. Um, so where, where are we going to go from here? Um, uh, well, I want you to think about a question. Um, what, uh, what do you think women HIV researchers and women living with HIV have in common? So I presented on both. What do you think they have in common? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think they have in common. To me, the commonality is gender-based violence. It is violence against women. I know some of you may see it right away and others, you are likely saying, no way. Uh, women HIV uh, researchers don't experience gender-based violence, but you'll think about it and you'll realize it's true. It is, and there is persistent and pervasive violence against women in our society at multiple structural and micro levels. In my view, and I admit this is my view, the violence is so pervasive and systemic for women researchers that they actually accept it as normal. I really haven't felt sexism, several said in their interviews, when the patriarchy is obvious when you look at the statistics. For women living with HIV, the violence and trauma is more blatant uh, and obvious. As Bell Hooks wrote, the fear of women being alone or unloved has caused women of all races to passively accept sexism and sexist oppression. For those of you who haven't studied violence and trauma, here is a brief tutorial in this diagram. Violence is the abusive act that happens to you or to someone from the outside. That act can be physical, sexual, mental, verbal. It's the violence and abuse that happens to you from the outside, like a microaggression uh, that could happen with someone that says, that is abuse and violence. And the trauma is what you do or what someone does to themselves on the inside based on that violence. Like saying, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worth anything. Uh, I'm not important. I don't deserve it. I'm an imposter. That is all trauma that you're doing to yourself on the inside. And by the way, none of that is true. What I'm proposing is that we aim to apply trauma-informed practice to research, trauma-informed research. Trauma-informed practice is understanding the pervasive nature of violence and trauma and promotes environments of healing and recovery. I propose we all practice trauma-informed research. We are at a research conference after all. Not only should we practice trauma-informed research with our study participants and patients, but also with our staff, students, colleagues, and ourselves. What I'm proposing for us all is to be allies to fight for equity, social justice, and for a supportive, caring environment for everyone to actualize their true nature and potential.
And so I'm asking you to be allies in this. And what does it mean to be an ally? It means recognizing one's own privilege and sometimes using that privilege to demand equity. It means recognizing the oppression and inequities experienced by groups unlike you and to see these inequities as unjust. It means to sympathize, to listen and learn about the experiences of those who experience oppression and, uh, not, uh, and to not dismiss them and to do so with humility. It means to take action for social justice, to speak up, lift up, mentor, sponsor, and take action against oppression and inequities. And in our field and what I have learned, you're invited and accepted to be an ally. Um, and I, uh, I thank my many uh, Indigenous and Black uh, colleagues who've accepted me um, as an ally. Um, even if you're not accepted yet to be an ally, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, still strive uh, 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 to carry out all of these actions. Okay, well, what should we do as allies? What do women living with HIV need from us as allies? Maureen already mentioned it, and I'm gonna mention it again, because we as the researchers, as the clinicians and the funders, we are the gatekeepers. Those in the field of women and HIV have heard it over and over again. Women living with HIV are asking for women only spaces. They need funding for the reopening and opening of women only aid service organizations. So I plead with the funders, can you please just give them the funding? Otherwise, we are perpetuating the structural sexism and the rates of HIV in women will continue to rise. Women living with HIV need women only spaces to gather with other women to bond and heal. They need peer supported and gendered HIV care. What do you think? Do you agree, Brecklin? Yes, absolutely. What about women HIV researchers? What do they need from us as allies? They need us to talk about the issues, talk about the issues, for example, that I'm bringing up today. They need us to invite, encourage, and demand diversity at the table. They need us to mentor and sponsor gender and racially diverse investigators and speakers. They need us to involve the community at all stages of research and they need us to practice trauma-informed research. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, and uh, some of you may have noticed, I uh, slightly changed my title. Um, and uh, in, my in my new title, I've asked uh, for a call for a reckoning. That is quite a lofty, uh, a request and a big word, uh, but it's really, I can't, I, it's, it's really not a reckoning, but it's a continued reckoning. Um, I'm not asking anything new, uh, even in this talk. This is not new information, just maybe presented in a new way. In 2017, we saw the gender inequities and horrors exposed by the Me Too movement. In 2020, the whole world finally saw the anti-Black racism and violence exerted by the police in the murder of George Floyd. And we all know about the many social justice and civil rights activist movements that have made such uh, strides before that. However, we cannot just accept the progress that we've made in the last few years as enough. We must continue to push for full justice and freedom for all to reach their full potential. And we can get there with trauma-informed practice and being allies all together. So please accept my calling. Thank you very much. At Chiwos, we dedicate our presentations to and honor the 73 women who participated in the study who died while we were running the study 
and likely the many more who died since. I cry every time I think of you and your families. Also, I'd like to acknowledge all the women living with HIV who participated in and, and have contributed to my research. I thank this long list of collaborators and partners, and I thank my funders, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the CTN. And thank you to Vijaya, Manakshi, Priscilla, Jill, Ashley, and Yaz, who helped me with my slides. And of course, I thank Brecklin uh, for presenting with me. It has been a highlight of my career to work so closely with you over the past decade, um, along with the many other community research co consultants that we've worked with. And uh, Brecklin and I um, I would be happy to accept um, questions. Thank you so much. That was such a powerful, interesting, thought-provoking talk. Um, there's opportunities to leave questions in the chat. There is one, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that there, this will populate as as we um, take this first question. Um, so thank you again, um, Brecklin and Mona, that was really fantastic. Um, the question that's in the chat, I don't know if, if you see it, but I, I can read it. It said, uh, is it possible that some of the increased feminization that we are seeing in HIV infection could also be due to a reduction in the amount of infection in gay, uh, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men? Yes, so um, there's been a big movement across Canada uh, to increase access for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, which is essential. So um, uh, distributing and making a PrEP as accessible as possible uh, to those at risk um, is very, very important. And, uh, and I'd like to see the numbers of, uh, and the new cases of HIV and gay and bisexual men who have sex with men go down even lower um, um, and, and ho however, the same strides have not been done uh, for women um, uh, living with HIV or people uh, who use and inject drugs. Um, and so I'd like to see the same uh, movements and, um, and uh, uh, degree of work for those populations. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions, so I have a question. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, okay, there's a question. I'll save mine. This question is for Brecklin. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Please put your questions in the chat. We have lots of time. Brecklin, did your experience with Chivos encourage you to keep working in research? That's the slightly hard question to say no to, considering Mona is here. But <laughs> maybe you could talk about what your experience was like and what you liked about it. That's you know, um, or and maybe challenges too. Yeah. So the answer to the question is yes. Um, I think you know throughout my time with Chiwos, um, there's lot been a lot of knowledge for me and growth. And um, I think that it's definitely encouraged me to stay involved and become um, an advocate and a support for women living with HIV. And it's, it's very meaningful work for me. Um, so I feel like it has enriched my life in so many ways. And, and it's, it's really beautiful, all of the connections that I've made and, and even the fact that I'm here today presenting this prestigious lecture with Mona is just uh, absolutely a dream. And, and um, I'm just really honored to be a part of this work. Oh, that's, that's so, what a lovely response. Thank you, Brecklin. Uh, we have quite a few more questions now, which is really exciting. Um, so uh, I think this one is from, I won't, I won't read it who it's from, um, Mona. What do you see as the biggest factor that's increased our representation of women HIV researchers in Canada to date? I actually think this is from Jason Brophy, um, Jason B. I might be wrong. Uh, what do you see as first steps to increase representation of BIPOC women? 
So that's two questions. What is the biggest factor that's in increased representation of women HIV researchers in Canada? And what do we need to do next, I think, to increase um, representation of BIPOC women? Okay, at first I, I thought, I read the question Jason and I thought it was for women about women living with HIV, but it's about women HIV researchers. Um, I what the what um, what women HIV researchers uh, said in the interviews um, over and over again is that um, is that it it had a lot to do with mentorship. So the women from one generation mentored uh, women in the next generation to become HIV researchers. So it's a lot of women mentoring women, mentoring more women, um, you know, which, it, which creates, I think, a very um, uh, unique and uh, supportive um, environment. I think also um, a lot of uh, women, um, uh, you know, are, are, do tend to lean towards uh, the, the social justice um, um, angle and uh, lens in terms of wanting to make a difference in, in uh, research, um, and which would be another reason uh, to go into the field uh, of HIV. But I, I do want to mention how important um, that the mentorship piece uh, ha um, has been, um, uh, was reviewed. And probably the biggest um, feedback to a junior HIV researcher was to look for great mentors. Um, and how do we get more um, BIPOC women HIV researchers? Well, first of all, we have to support them so we don't lose them. Um, uh, look how stressed uh, Maureen looked, and I heard it in the interviews. Um, Black women uh, HIV scholars um, are not being supported. We have to support them. Uh, we have to make them feel safe and comfortable um, and then uh, support more uh, graduate students, postdoctoral students, uh, more uh, black women going into medical school uh, and, and undergrad uh, right from high school. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. I'm gonna to try to shake it up and um, ask one maybe uh, that both of you could answer, which is, uh, looking at the crisis in Saskatchewan, how, and I'm just reading it as it's written, how do we best support our PAWS sisters there? What can we do nationally? Um, well, I think we have to talk about it. Um, I um, Politically, we have to put pressure. It's not acceptable, the rates of HIV in Saskatchewan. And, um, and um, I think you know, the front line there, I work with the front line staff, they are working so hard, um, but funding is not being directed towards HIV in the province. Um, and it should be, uh, it, it's really, I don't think it's that hard what needs to be done there. Um, uh, a, a program like what's been done with Stop HIV um, in uh, British Columbia um, can be easily rolled out, um, but uh, it takes funding. Uh, and it takes political will. So we need to put uh, pressure on uh, on the politicians, on the funders, and just and say we'll work with them um, uh, to make it possible. Uh, I think uh, women in uh, Saskatchewan do need women only spaces um, and need women um, outreach support. Um, imagine if there was a um, a uh, woman only space that was supporting women and and um, was cushioned in the in the in um, as a women's health um, uh, uh, clinic and um, and women could bring their children. I saw a question about uh, combining women and, and children care. I think that that's important. At least allow women to bring their children. And uh, yes, if if the clinic could provide care, but not only to the children who uh, are living with HIV, but but all, all their children. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, outreach, uh, funding, um, a program uh, like Stop HIV, um, you know, I think we could make a difference in Saskatchewan. Great, and, and Brooklyn, do you have any also perspectives to add on how there could be some national support among uh, women living with HIV for, for women in Saskatchewan? That was a part of the question too. 
Uh, yeah, I think Mona answered this question really well. I, if I can just add, like, I guess I'm always like advocating for peer support, right? So just peer support. And I think also not on a national level, it's it's been especially helpful in, in my experience to connect virtually, right? Because you can you, you can reach um, people in, in different places throughout Canada um, without having to travel and 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 such. So I, I think that's been a little bit helpful in connecting us all together a little bit. That's that's wonderful. And there's another uh, uh, a question here around, you know, it says, do you provide training on trauma-informed practices and maybe trauma-informed research? And if, if you're not specifically providing training, maybe you could share some key principles and where, where um, the listeners and watchers could learn more. Yeah, so in preparing this talk, I, uh, I um, looked for materials on training for uh, trauma-informed practice and research. And I think you're right. There is a lack of availability on training um, on trauma-informed care, a trauma-informed practice and research. So maybe that's something CAR can do um, or, the, or the CTN to develop a training, um, a training program. Um, so, uh, Canadian experts in the field um, include um, uh, Dr. Neora Pick um, in Vancouver, Dr. Jesseline Rana uh, in Toronto, uh, Jay McGilvery, who's a um, midwife, um, as well as Elder Valerie Nicholson, um, and uh, actually Brecklin also is working on a, um, a trauma aware, um, tra uh, trauma and violence aware uh, care model. But I do think it's something uh, that we need to do. Um, we do have um, some training in the women centered HIV care uh, toolkit. We have a toolkit that you can uh, find online for free uh, at just put in women centered HIV care. Uh, toolkit uh, and really um, trauma informed practice comes down uh, to being one thing just being nice, uh, listening, uh, being open, saying I believe you um, and um, and and building a environment of trust um, and safety. So those are the basic principles, but I, I think actually it's something uh, that we should do. Thank, thank you so much. And since you mentioned Neora, I'm going to raise her question. Uh, Neora uh, Pick, I believe there's one Neora P. This, this is most likely. Maybe Neora, this is not you, but there's a question from Neora. There are good examples of women centered research and care in Canada and St. Justine and Oak Treat Clinic in BC. How do we knowledge translate and disseminate these very effective methods of care for women and families to other places in Canada? Is there a way to use these models for po political advocacy? Yeah, so um, um, the Oak Tree uh, Clinic has um, has actualized women-centered HIV care even before we developed the model. It's really they're the the um, uh, they uh, they are the the lead in uh, in um, in uh, actualizing uh, the model where they provide. Uh, full um, women's care under uh, one roof, um, providing tr uh, trauma-informed care, person-centered care, the HIV care, uh, women's health and sexual and reproductive health care, mental health care, addiction care, and um, peer support under one roof. And um, I, 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 we, uh, uh, Wangari um, Tharao, uh, who, as you mentioned, uh, um, and I um, and Natisha Mastkoy submitted a um, an application to do something similar in Ontario, um, and which would be great to support. And I think we would have a lot of success here. So yes, Neora, uh, we'd love to see a similar model in Toronto. It, San Justine. Um, so what we heard uh, in Chivos, we did a formative phase with uh, focus groups. And what we heard about San Justine is that San Justine takes care of a women living with HIV when they're pregnant, but then sends them back to their primary care. And we actually heard that um, women uh, in Montreal would love if San Justine could support like a full package, for example, 
um, uh, pap testing and so forth. Um, if I'm not correct, I'm sure uh, Isabel from the Saint Justine will correct me, but um, that kind of model in Oak Tree, I think women living with HIV would appreciate it uh, um, all over the country. Great, thank you so much. There's a few questions that are similarly themed. So uh, I noticed that Joanne Lindsay wrote a question um, that I've also seen some of the themes with, uh, with regards to this, which was, Mona, I look forward to reading your book. I also look forward to that. What do either of you think are prospects for creating women-only spaces across our vast country? Is it in our near future? And we actually also had a similar question that was an anonymous question, which is why might be, I know I'm not sure where it is, but it, oh, can you speculate as to why we might see HIV specific clinics for gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men when women-centered clinics are not being prioritized? So I think both of those questions are really around what are the prospects of a women-centered uh, HIV space, women-only space, and um, yeah. Um, well, I did hear that the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, gave a little bit of funding to, to support a, a, um, a women's only gathering, but to me, um, that's just the start. Um, I think that um, you know, um, because uh, so, uh, so much of the world and uh, across the country, we can reach each other virtually. Um, I think that um, even a virtual national uh, women community-based organization would be essential. I'd love to see that funded um, 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 as, as well as supporting local ones um, in, uh, in uh, each province. I think women-only spaces are essential. Otherwise women don't feel safe and won't go and won't be supported. Um, do I think it's close. I hope after this talk, the funders are listening. If not, send them the talk. Um, I'd like to see that funded uh, in the next, um, in the next uh, uh, cycle. Um, why do I think? I think that when you look at the numbers, um, you know, absolutely the majority of the cases and the new cases are in gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. Um, and a lot of times, um, I get, um, it, it's assumed that by talking about women, uh, that it's a competition between women and gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. And I don't think it's a competition. Um, I think that uh, we have to address all the issues. Uh, but I, I, I think that it's this concept of scarcity that people uh, get driven by and fear um, uh, that uh, make people, uh, you know, try um, uh, to say, oh, well, the, maybe the women don't need the funding. Uh, but women do need the funding, um, and it's not a competition. Um, the uh, rates of women are, the rates of HIV are increasing in women, and women have special, special needs. And as you can see, and you can imagine, they're often in uh, unique, underpowered, and precarious um, uh situations, living in violence, uh, underhoused, uh, with food insecurity, um, and, uh, um, and, and, and so I, I think we showed the numbers that it's essential uh, to provide the care to women. Um, and I'd like to see that happen in the next year. Thank you so much. So there's, with the, the number of minutes we have left, I might just try one last question and fold in if there's time, a question that's quite related to it. So Mark Y, I think maybe that's Mark Uden, wrote, hi to all three of you and congrats Brecklin and Mona on your beautiful and inspiring talk. Aww. Working with community has been one of the highlights of my clinical and research career. For both of you, what have you found to be the rewards and challenges of doing researchers with researchers and community together? And um, there was another talk that was uh, highly voted on, which was around how can um, peer research associates move to being principal or co-principal investigators or coordinators. But maybe you, you know we, you can touch on both. What are some of the benefits and rewards and challenges of, of community engaged research, and also um, supporting uh, peer researchers to to lead research? 
Do you want to start, Brecklin, or I, I'll start and then pass on to you? Okay. Um, I, 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 as Mark said, hi, Mark. I, I love working with you and, um, and uh, Jay and, um, and yeah, we've had a great career uh, working in partnership with community. And I, I have to say that working with community members, um, um, women living with HIV ha has been a highlight of my career. And I wouldn't do, and practicing uh, community-based research, I wouldn't do it any other way. And I personally think all researchers should practice community-based research. Uh, the highlight has been um, building relationships, but the highlight is also um, the positive, but also the challenge, which is I've learned so much. Um, one challenge is I get yelled at a lot, but, uh, but I, I don't think that that's necessarily bad. Um, I'm challenged. I learn. My thoughts are challenged. Um, I, I've learned so much about in Indigenous culture and embraced it uh, and continue to learn um, about the horrors that happened uh, to, in this land and to the first people of this country, um, which I think is really important um, as someone living here. Um, and I learned what I can do um, uh, from my Indigenous colleagues and friend um, for reconciliation. Um, I think also the challenge within our institutions, our structural institutions, is for them to get it um, and for them to break down their structural processes. Getting paid um, a month or two late is not okay uh, for, uh, for community members or, um, or people living with HIV. You saw the numbers. That is also our peers are living on those incomes of less than $20,000 a year. So I, I think that's been a real challenge is, um, is having the structural organizations change their systems uh, that you have to pay right away. You have to change the way. And, and I think that I think re as researchers, we have to keep pushing. Uh, we have to keep writing the letters. We have to keep um, writing the emails that those systems uh, uh, need to change. Um, um, and uh, we've made changes at our in, at Women's College Hospital, and they've embraced it. Um, but I'd like to see it at more institutions. What do you think, Brecklin, about the highlights and um, challenges doing community-based research? Yeah, so I think that definitely the highlights are the relationships. And I, I'm going to say especially the connections I've made with people living with HIV and having them entrust me with their stories um, has been really uh, profound and um, has helped me to learn. Um, and uh, so the connections and also the possibility of, you know, what we can do with the research, what changes will be made, the support that will happen, um, that is really encouraging for me to stay in this work. And I would say the challenges are definitely dealing with policies and procedures of, um, you know, different, um, you know, payment and red tape with um, the different um, entities. But also, uh, I think the fact that I'm I'm not, you know, accredited in any way has been a challenge a little bit. So, you know, not having a PhD or education in research has been a bit of a challenge and just like um, kind of just having that accreditation of life, which I've embraced. <laughs> and so, and I hope that can be more embraced in research in this work. Thank you so much. Uh, I know we have 55 uh, seconds left. So I don't know if there's one last word that you want to leave people with our wonderful speakers and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and um, and like uh, Mark Weinberg, I think all of us uh, should be uh, social justice warriors together as allies um, and uh, practice trauma informed research um, and uh, and and uh, and demand uh, uh, social justice so for um, equity and uh, and freedom for all. So thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you, everybody. And uh, we're really grateful you attended and we're really grateful to Mona and Brecklin for sharing all your wisdom today. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the conference.